house in Moonstone Heights, which is in uh, near Trinidad, California. Moonstone Cross. Moonstone Cross. It's a different area, huh? Is that right? Yes. Because the roads cross there or something? Or? The old railroad crossing. The old railroad crossing, because yeah. Humboldt County was directly connected to lumber, and they used to haul the lumber out on railroad lines that were all over this county. And with her is her friend Susanna as they would call her. Uh, and they've been uh, good friends for a long time. Now, both of them served in the Peace Corps in the 60s, in the very beginning of the movement, the Peace Corps movement, which was established by um, the President Kennedy to help the world adjust to the things that need to be adjusted to, to survive. And from my Understanding, uh, Senegal was the first country that had Peace Corps members come from the United States. No? Ghana. Ghana. Yeah, Thank you for correcting me. Ghana. Okay. I read Senegal, but you you would know better than I. And then Zanzibar came into the picture. Now, what year was this when you were both in the Peace Corps? Sure. Um, I went over in 1962, and we were the, our group was an all-female group of uh, 27 women, 25 re registered nurses, and two medical technologists. Those are the people who test blood and do lab tests and things like that. Um, and we were the second group in country. That, that we, at that time it was called Tanganyika. And the very first group, the T1s as they're called, came, preceded us by a year and they came in 1961. And they were the very first group into training and they were actually very first group in country but they could not be recognized because Tanganyika was not yet independent. So Ghana then, the Ghana volunteers arrived in Ghana after these T1 guys, and all a male group by the way, but Peace Corps never could say that the T1s were the first in service because it would have been politically incorrect since the country was not yet independent. So that this has been for 60 years a discussion about who was first and who was second. Mm -hmm. um, so I was there from 62 to 64. Then uh, Peace Corps asked me to go back to Syracuse, New York, where my training preparation occurred. Um, Syracuse at the time had an East African Studies Center and they asked me to go back and help to prepare the next group, uh, some of whom were nurses. And I did that, and I had serious re-entry shock to the United States. 
States and couldn't stand being here, so I asked if I could go back for another two years. Tisa was in Syracuse at the time that I was on the staff, and we met each other, and then they sent me back. They didn't know what to do with me, so she needed a roommate, I needed a roommate, and we became roommates. And that would have been in January of 65. And then you were then you were sent to Tanzania, Tanzania. Yes. yes. As the two of you are in a group. Well, she was in a later group. They numbered all of these four groups. She was in this, a group six add-on. It was called group six. Is good enough for this discussion. And um, we became roommates, and we had a wonderful, wonderful time. And by that time. The country of Tanganyika had united with the island of Zanzibar, which is 30 miles off the coast, or less than that. Anyway, it's right off the east coast on the Indian Ocean, and so they had to come up with a new name. So Tanganyika, and then they put Zanzibar together, and they came up with Tanzania. And Zanzibar was inhabited by Arab um, people and black people from India and and uh, black people from India and did that w did that make the Zanzibar different than the mainland of Africa? Yes. Well, and can I pick up on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the. Uh, the population of Tanganyika when I first went over in 62, when, when Tisa went over too, we were told was a third Christian, a third Muslim, and a third animist religions or traditional religions. Zanzibar was 99.9% .9 Muslim because Arabs had settled there and it became a slave trading port for shipping people out to some place in the East, God knows where. So Zanzibar was different in that the Muslim population was much larger and still is. And how did that affect you being women? We were just, would you want to answer that? How did that affect you being women? Uh, I really don't think it was any particular drawback to being a woman mm -hmm. in that country. I think we always, we were told in Peace Corps training in Syracuse that not to wear shorts, not to wear slacks, uh, that most of the women dressed in longer skirts and there were these beautiful fabrics that we could buy if they had political slogans on them, they were called kagas. If they were just decorative ones, you know, she's got some around here, that one's from West Africa, but beautiful, um, lightweight cotton cloths called kitengis. And we learned how to tie them around our waist, and then you tuck them in, and they go all the way down to your ankles, and they would just make very pretty skirts. So as long as, you know, you have like a skirt on, you were respectful of the culture. And we could go back and forth between Zanzibar and the mainland and all over the country with these Cape on, right? Mm -hmm. In the early days, in 64, we were, you know, we wore sleeveless tops. Yeah. And then in 2000, we didn't, we only wore short sleeve tops. When we went back. I forgot that. You went back? We went in, in 2006. One of the T1 guys, the one that I spoke of earlier, um, got in touch with a bunch of us and said, hey, we're going to take a safari to East Africa who wants to come. Oh, and, yes. And we set it up, and there were about 15, 16, 17 of us with friends and loved ones. And, significant others and blah, blah. 
who went. And it had become more, case of point is, women's dress had become more conservative. Yes. Enough, because mm. the Muslim influence had grown. You're right. Yeah. And did you have to learn Swahili? Yes. Oh yes. Was that was that necessary? Yes. Absolutely. Susanna was very very fluent. Do you still remember it? Yeah, I take lessons about every week still. Um, I mean, I you know, there's a, a lady that's. Does them online for a group called Free for mm. Friends of Tanzania, and I just try to get out. And it just keeps the, the brain cells going, you know. It's, it's fun. And from what I was reading about the history of Tanzania, it was once a Portuguese colony, and then a German colony, and then a British colony, and then they gained independence. Okay, Did, were those? Were those? Was that obvious that there was Portuguese no. or British or oh. German there at one time? At any point, anything like the music or the food? Yeah, or... There, there was. Um, I don't think any of Tanzania was never a colony, and I don't recall the Portuguese <laughs> history there particularly. But it was a German protectorate during World War Two, right? And there were. There were German outstations. Then somehow Britain became involved. It was never a British colony either, but Kenya was to the north. And that really made a lot of difference, I think, um, for the better. I think that they were fortunate not to have been full colonial status. Um, and that the British influence was pretty strong, you know when we were there, and they were called expats, and some of them were just intolerable, and, you know. And, it's arrogant. Well, the, the, they were so racist and so mm. awful, and, uh, you know, I remember, can I keep talking or should I? Okay. One, um, I worked in the, in the big hospital. I'm a registered nurse, and it's kind of like being ordained, you know, your whole life. Um, so I, um, I was working in a big hospital on men's surgical ward, and I had a young patient admitted on a Friday. I had the weekend off, and he came in with a strangulated hernia, a inguinal hernia, which is a very common thing in young men, but especially if they do a lot of uh, physical labor, and then the, then it's not a complicated surgery. Just reduce the hernia and stitch it back up. I could almost do it myself. Well, the British surgeon was gone for the weekend and he didn't want any of the Tanzanian doctors to do anything with this guy, just leave him. When I came back on Monday morning, he was dead. He was 33 years old and it was a useless death because it became strangulated and then became infected and then he got peritonitis and nobody could save him. But this guy was off golfing, you know? And his attitude was, well, there's just another one, there'll be another one to take his place. Right. And so that kind of stuff was quite prevalent. And Pisa probably has memories too of. And both of you were nurses? No. No, no. I was a librarian. Librarian, because the Peace Corps is based on agricultural education and uh, medical procedures that to enhance the health and wealth of the people that were in those areas. And you were you were a, a librarian, and so what was your main role there? I was a librarian for in Dar es Salaam, but then I went up country and I was teaching in Upper Primary School. Teaching just all yeah, fifth subjects. Through eighth grade, fifth through ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And were you treated differently because you were American as yeah. a visitor? Was there like, was there any times when you felt like you you could have been in danger or that you needed protection or you needed like? Did they ever feel like, oh, we need to, you need to have 
security with you when you go to this area or anything like that? I don't think so, no. I never felt safer in my life. Yeah. Uh, I was talking before about the re-entry shock that I had. You know, I came, when I went back to work with her group training at Syracuse, at 24 hours I went from my little town up near Lake Victoria, and I would, had a different roommate then because Tisa hadn't come. In 24 hours, I was at O'Hare Airport in Chicago, looking out over the mass of cars. I couldn't remember how to make a long distance call, putting a dime in, call my parents in Minneapolis. And, <laughs> and I got home, and the next day, my mama said, we go down to the two blocks away, it was this little corner grocery store, and we go down and get me, walk down and get me all these little groceries. And here was this, long shelf with, you know, like 25 different kinds of cereal, all with the unit pricing and all that stuff. And, and Tisa and I, and things were too much simpler. And I remember just freaking out, thinking no wonder when people come here, how they can't handle the complexity of this culture. So I went to Syracuse for a few months, did my thing, and I went back again. And then I had a, a wonderful experience. Um, well, it was probably during my first tour. I was hitchhiking from Dar es Salaam, the capital city, on the coast inland to uh, a city that was about 75 miles away. And the roads were terrible, and the buses were always breaking down, but it was fun. Because we'd all get off the bus, and we'd help the bus driver change the tire or fix the car or whatever it was, everybody would get off. But on this trip, somebody dropped me by the side of the road and I was only halfway to my destination. And out of the bush behind me, the trees, came this elderly lady, Tanzanian lady, with an old crickety wooden chair. And we greeted each other in Swahili. And she put the chair down for me to sit and wait for the bus to come. Yeah. And she sat there with me. I mean, I, I never worried about it. It was very safe. And you asked if we, people knew we were Americans and they treated us better because as Peace Corps volunteers, we were, weren't gonna be like the Brits, so many of the Brits were, I'm sorry if there's anybody that's British <laughs> just listening to this, but some of your compatriots who were, who represented the United Kingdom during the colonial years weren't the brightest stars in the flag, I don't think. Now, was Peace Corps members just all Americans or were there other nationalities that were? It was all Americans. All Americans. And no other groups, there were other groups, I'm well, sure. There were other uh, people from the British Islands, but they weren't called Peace Corps. It, it was a similar Canada organization. Is. Yes, Canada, we, in our building, That's we right, had a Canada. Canadian, he, he wasn't a Peace Corps, but he was like that. And I worked um, with a couple of ladies from Germany, nurses. Right. Um, so there were other people who were there. Now Zanzibar, is it true that there's no cars there? I don't know if there's cars there. Oh, because there's a song, there Zanzibar. Cars, no. Not yeah. many. Okay. Do they have, is Zanzibar a very well-organized island? No. No? Like freeways, infrastructure? Oh, no, it's... Well, no freeways. I mean, not freeways, but ro I mean, maintain roads, uh, uh, police force, uh, military. Well, they're part of Tang they were part of Tanzania, mm -hmm. so it's the same government system, the same. You know, it's all the all the money for maintenance comes from the mainland. Uh, they're not yeah. a separate country. Yeah. What about the other islands that were along the coast there? Um, well, actually. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I, go ahead. 
I just mentioned Kemba. Contestants. Kemba. Okay, actually, the name for. Uh, and somebody's going to give me a test now on this, make sure I got it all right. There's a. a it's, the term said, uh, Unguja, Unguja, which includes Zanzibar and Kemba. And the two islands together are called Unguja. But most people, when they refer to Unguja, are just talking about Zanzibar alone. Pemba was another island close up uh, to the north of Zanzibar. Beautiful places. Oh. Yeah. Jambo, which means. Hello. 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 And what's goodbye? Guahele. 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 H-E-R-I. Guajere. You almost roll the R in like a Spanish R, but not quite. Guajere. Guajere. Yeah. And did people speak English or? Oh. No? No? Yes. You see, the, the first president of Tanzania, Julius Nureri, was a teacher. He got his master's in education in England, and he was committed to that the whole country would be would be educated, and so he put a lot of emphasis on schools. And they, uh, but he did not make, unlike Kenya, Kenya made English the national language. <coughs> he decided to keep Swahili the national language because it would bring people together. There's 125 tribes yeah. or dialects in Tanzania, and they caused people didn't always understand each other, but if you make Swahili the national language, it would unify everybody. Mm -hmm. But he put a big emphasis on education. And then in secondary school, when kids get in to about middle school or high school, they start, then they're instructed in English instead of in Swahili. There's a lot of controversy around that, even to this day that maybe Swahili should be the language of instruction all the way through high school. But the little kids are taught in Swahili, but then when you get into like eighth or ninth grade, then they start teaching you in English. So a lot of people speak English. Lots and lots of people speak English. Now, not then. Yeah. Now, I remember being in a friend's car and sitting in the passenger seat and on the floor was a cassette of something. I picked it up and on it was written, Wagogo, W-A-G-O-G-O. -G -O. And I go, what's this? And he goes, I don't know, I think it's some kind of band or something. So I go, can I have it? And so he gave it to me. I, I took it home. It was amazing music from Tanzania. <laughs> the most amazing music I've ever heard in my whole life. It, it was nothing like any other African music that I had heard. It, it blew my mind, the Wagogo tribe. tribe. Yeah. It's one of the, the Wagogo are right in the middle of the country and they speak Kigogo. Kigogo. Yeah. I mean, the, so, I mean, that's how, you know, like where, where I lived, The K-I goes in front of it, and that's the language. But the Wadok, Wagogo, were in the Dodoma area. Those are all the Wagogo right around there. And they speak Kigogo. And they have Kigogo music. And that's probably what you heard. That's what I heard, and yeah. it's still, I listen to it, and it's, it's, not, it's not like anything else I've ever heard. It's magical. It's like the pygmy music was magical. The Wagogo tribe created the most magical music I've ever heard, That's, ever. Wouldn't it be fun to hear that? We spend a great deal of time dancing. Oh, indeed. Um, and the music, the pop music of the time was uh, this kind of Congolese stuff that came from the Congo, which was to, wet, to the West, with lots of uh, electric guitars mm -hmm. and wonderful kind of twangy stuff. I mean, even today, if you put it on, and I can't sit still. Remember what my, our, our youngest son, Nick and I, were here visiting Tisa a few years ago, and she put on some music, and Tisa and I just got up and danced, you remember? <laughs> and Nick was so, you know, my mom and her friends are dancing. Um, but I mean, you can't sit still. It's, it's so wonderfully, 
complex. Complex, complex but lovely riffs that yes. people do. And, you know, I, I don't know that much about it, but it's just, there's a certain sound at the time that came out of the Congo that was all over East and Southern Africa. And then Southern South African music is different. It's not, it's looser, not quite as tight. It's more Marion Makeba style. Mm -hmm. um, what are those dudes called? Matela Queen, Matela Queen and the Lady Smith, Lady Smith Black Mombazo. Yeah, that's Lady Smith, that's what I was trying to remember. Uh, Lady Smith, that a little bit more Melodic isn't the right word, but a little kind of smoother and more lilty. Mm. And not with, still with a lot of rhythm, but not the, the real rhythm that I, we used to feel anyway. Well, my friend goes to Africa a lot and he says he's a musician. He's all over Africa. They all look to the Congolese music as yes. the number one yes. music. It's, they all admire it. Yes. And it's because of those reasons that you just gave me, which is yeah. very complex. Yeah. Sometimes they'll have three or four guitar players yeah. and they're all doing these very little intricate it's little been things. That way for, for decades. And they get their part and they just stick to it. Yeah. Now I have an old recording of a group old a group of old men from Kampala playing a song called The Raven. And it's them singing, playing these harps. Oh, wow. And again it was like the most magical music I've ever heard. So that region, Eastern Africa, yeah. has the most magical sound that's just unexpected. I mean, African music as a whole has always, to me, has been the most amazing music because it comes pure from the earth, yeah. you know, and from the energy of the universe that is yeah. like goes right through them, through their music. And that's why all over the world it's been admired and even down to like reggae music is found all over yeah, the world now. Yeah, that's a lot of, hey, yeah, that's a wonderful way to describe it. And then North African music's got a lot more minor uh, chords because of the Arabic influence yeah. to them. There's a, a major recording company that you probably know called Putumayo. Yeah. And they do tons right. of Africa all yeah. over the continent from every country. It's really wonderful. Yeah, they, they're a big, big industry now. Yeah. Well, thanks for that little bit and piece about the dance and the music because that really filled the gap in between my yeah. wondering about your journey into Tanzania and Zanzibar because music is a big part of it and the earth is a bigger part yeah. of everything. Yeah. And life is should to be, of course, to live. When you were in Tanzania and Zanzibar in the 60s, did you have any um, experiences where they took you to a place where it was a non-traditional uh, culture or the, the, the old traditional culture where they're like, hey, there's this village that has these people that still do the same thing they've been doing for hundreds of years. Did you have those experiences? Uh... We were in so many villages. Yeah. Um, you know, things, the difference, let's see, it was 50 years, oh, when did we go? 40 years, 45 years between when we left and when we came back. So there have been a lot of changes in that time. Uh, and there, when we were there first time around, lots of places in the more rural parts of the country, people were still doing things that they've been doing for centuries, mm -hmm. and cooking the same way, and women doing all the work, and carrying all the water, and all that stuff. Um, when we did go back in 2006, we went to Maasai country. The Maasai are kind of a famous group of people. They're kind of regarded in Tanzania like the aboriginals are in Australia, where a lot of people think they're kind of backward, but the government is protecting them because they have their unique culture. Anyway, so we were up in the Kilimanjaro area, and we saw on the side of the road this Maasai tribesman and his, they always wear um, wool blankets across themselves, the men, that are blue and red pattern of some kind. 
and then they have their spears. And this guy's talking on a cell phone on the yes. side of the road. And I just thought that was wonderful. You His know. cell phones have connected Africa. You betcha. Together. <laughs> Even Maasai in the middle of nowhere have a cell phone yeah. and cell phone reception. That's right. That's right. Now, what did you? What do you think that you contributed to the the culture there as Peace Corps members and Americans? Huh. Would you ask that question again, please? What do you think you contributed as Peace Corps members and Americans being there in that time in that era? I hear that. I'm thinking about it. I think it was. I think it was really helpful for these kids to see other other people, um, you know, working side by side with their teachers. much more. Yeah. Um, I got so much. It changed my whole life, Sean, from one of the, and so focusing on acute care, curing and restoring health, to one of promoting and preventing health. So I went into public health when I came back. I got a master's and a PhD in community health nursing because of that experience, and I would have never done that. I think many people regard, I think we went, how can I say this, we went with the right attitude in our hearts. We went out of a motivation to help and to serve, not to exploit. And people picked up on that real quickly. I mean, they were, you know, nobody was being fooled. Also, also really important in my Opinion. I'd love to hear what Tisa thinks. Is our training was superb. We had, you know, three months of it, six days a week of intense training in the socio political and cultural background of the country um, and everything that was going on. And the language training was fabulous. Mm -hmm. So by the time we got there, and then we, when our group got there, we had another seven weeks of six hours a day of Swahili. So by the time I hit that floor with my 30 patients, 50 on each side, I was pretty comfortable. The language, and so to answer your question, being able to speak the language, yes. even stumbling over it, like a lot of our colleagues did, because some people have more language, you know, just proclivity than others do. It was a big thing. There was one time I was on the train going up country, that means away from the coast, and this British lady was in the dining car and she asked me to sit down with her. And I'd only been in, at, at lunch, and I'd only been in the country about four or five months. And she's been there 16 years or something. And she said, well, what do you think about these people? And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, they're so rude, aren't they? They never say thank you. She didn't know that, that or she didn't say, uh, they never say please, not thank you. They never say please. She didn't know that please is built into the conjugation of the verb. So like kupa, it means to give. If you want to say give me, you say nike, which means Will you please give me? I've been there four months. She'd been there 16 years and didn't know that. And that, I mean, I just can't tell you to this day how upsetting that was, that how she just wrote off people because she hadn't taken the time to learn the language. I think language is critical, don't you? Yeah. Now, did you, when you were there, did you meet other people that were not part of the Peace Corps or any kind of help service, but was just there to be there? Did you meet people that were like that, like travelers? Yes. Mm -hmm. And 
where either there was in passing, like you might see them somewhere and start talking to them because was that rare? I don't think it was so rare. But with Dar es Salaam, we yeah. had people. Dar es Salaam was a very cosmopolitan place. And there were people but from there were all only cultures. three white girls. Pardon me? There were only three white girls. No, well, and we were young, single females. We had lots of young gentlemen from all different nationalities visiting us. Uh, and Chisa had a good friend from Nigeria. And, you know, but that, you know, they would come and go and that would be a fine guys. Do you remember hiding in the dead? Just so that nobody could see oh. through the glass <laughs> door? <laughs> no, I forgot about that. Well, what happened? Yeah, we were so overwhelmed with visitors. And our front doors had glass in them, so we were hiding under the bed in the bed, so nobody could see us. <laughs> Did anyone propose to you? I have four oh, yes. in one year, and she had a bunch too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Two from American Peace Corps guys and, and stuff, so, yeah. But, Do you ever have dreams? Have Tanzania, Tanzania or Zanzibar in your sleeping dreams? Hmm. No, not really. Do you? I, when I lived in Mwanza, which was, this is before she came, my second year, I was in Mwanza, which was up on Lake Victoria in the northwestern part of the country, just a few miles up the road along the eastern course of uh, East shore of Lake Victoria is a place where President Obama's father came from I mean, into Kenya, but was pretty close to the Kenya. Anyway, I dreamt in Swahili a couple of times when I would have a whole day, eight or ten hours as in the hospital, and then come home and my roommate Annie was gone or something. And I didn't hadn't spoken any English all day long. I would occasionally have dreams in Swahili. But that was a long time ago. I don't anymore. Can you say something? Can you say something to the to the Tanzanian people in Swahili in case someone from Tanzania ever sees this film? What I said was, we're sitting here talking about Tanzania and the time when we were young women, beautiful young women. I didn't say that, but I could have added it. And how nice it was to think about that. Uh -huh. <laughs> nice, bringing back memories. Yeah. Well, this is the interview is about to end. Um, I really appreciate you two uh, being here and, and being together, which is pretty unique. And this was a unique experience for me. Um, and this film will be on my, my Sean Shadows on uh, YouTube. And I think that's gonna do it. I really appreciate you both uh, giving me this time to talk about Tanzania and your days in the Peace Corps in the early 60s. I was born in 63, so I was part of that whole movement. And I'm, today I'm even part of that movement because I was born in an era that was, uh, that produced the, the new society and the Peace Corps and uh, the ideas of, of equality and freedom and uh, 
giving somebody a fair chance, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that's what that, the Peace Corps was all about, was giving these people a fair chance yeah. to like compete with the rest up. of the world, a leg up, yeah. Thank you for this recording. This is a recording of Suzanne and Tisa, who were in the Peace Corps in the early 60s. They were the first women to be joining the Peace Corps, teaching and being nurses. And this was recorded around March 2024. And the music that you're hearing is the Bogoko tribe of Tanzania. Thank you for being in Tanzania and Zanzibar. <laughs>